obviously I kind of shared where I have been at um, being a father, your son graduating, our daughter graduated last year, so we're in a chapter of life as well. So the emphasis this week has been on Braden, obviously, um, with everything that he has going on. And my, my parents flew in last Sunday, my brother came in from Texas. Some of you drove here today from various places, and I know when you come back, it's not just for Braden, but because everybody's in a relationship. Um, when you really see our church in action, it's very powerful, right? Like look, looking at it, we're not much, right? In the physical, but God does some, some pretty powerful things, and it's a great picture of the early church to me. And uh, I want to thank everybody. This church is incredibly loving and supportive, and we are all crazy. And so a bunch of crazies loving one another. But it is, it is very powerful, and the Lord sits at the center of all that. And so uh, my family has been the recipients of a lot of love um, over the years, but especially recently. And so I want to say thank you. Brayden has been blessed beyond measure in his life. And not so much in tangible ways, necessarily, uh, but in spiritual ways. So, so thank everybody for being a part of that. Um, I'm saying all that because that's just where I'm at. And I was able to speak a message. He, he graduated from Okeechobee Christian Academy, and it's you know 20, 20 miles west. And they have chapels every Friday. And I was blessed with the opportunity to share in that chapel on Friday. I've done it over the years numerous times, but this is like very significant for me just knowing that it was going to be his last chapel and knowing the boys that he graduated with. And it just so happened that there were seven graduates. There's only like 200 in the school. Uh, but seven seniors. And all of them were boys. And so as I prayed through, Lord, what do you want me to share with them? Um, I knew it was going to be something relative to manhood. And I... In my mind, I titled it Baby Boy. And, and I knew I was going to be squeezed. I thought, man, that's a great message. It's not just for high school kids getting ready to graduate. It's, it's for men in the program, but it's for me as well. Um, I have this opportunity to live in such a way. God is constantly putting me in a position. Will I choose to be a baby boy? Or will I choose to be a man? So that's, I felt like the message was, was apropos. I think there's a lot of parallel between these young men and where we are. These young men were, um, they were invested in. I mean, I was engaged watching teachers and parents and pastors. And I mean, a lot of time, effort, energy, money, prayer went into these young men. In the same with us, a lot of time, prayer, effort, input went into my life by from my parents to pastors to things that happened. We can look back at your life. Hindsight's always 2020, and you see those influences in your life. And for for what? You know, but why? What's the investment for? What do we show up here for? Why do you guys stay put? Right? Like, why is David Potts still here? Because something we know needs to take place, a change needs to occur within us in Anthony reality. Where we come in a certain way and we hope to leave a, a way. And that's, that's it's specified in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Isn't that what's supposed to happen? You know, not only in my son's life, not only in these young men, of course they're 18 and you want to see them move from babyhood, childhood into being a man. And there's all different ways that this takes place. But isn't that what's going on with some of us in this room? And I said I've been here for quite some time, but yet I'm still growing up. I find myself at times around in an environment or a situation that occurs and I feel very childish. Like I don't feel 54. 
of what does 54 feel like and what makes us a man. So all these things. I love Psalm uh, 78. It says, we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Why do we do that? Why do we speak that to the next generation? See, I'm like the third generation here at Dunklin. Uh, when you look at over the course of time, we've been here about 62 years. So every, every 20 years is a generation. So I am passing on to the next generation. Well, why do we do that? Well, it specifies later on in that chapter. It says, um, so that they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. So I'm not going to hide or, or, or ask forgiveness for what our purpose is. See, our purpose is that boys walk in the door. When I, we have 25, 30, 35, 40, 40 year old boys walking around this world. And I'm not coming, I, I was a 29 year old boy when I walked in this door. And at times I still find myself in that place, but I'm responding like a boy, I'm responding like a child. Father, help me be a man. Help me grow up. Isn't what that is supposed to do? As I eat and I feast and I apply this, right, Max Staten? Like, help me grow up into a man. So when I was when I was 29, I couldn't handle responsibility. I was living at my parents, grounded. 29. That was their treatment program for me. It didn't work very well. So I was I lived I was selfish. I would tell you that I love God and I love my family and I love those around me, but my behavior proved otherwise. I was childish to the nth degree. And so when I sat in this interview and they said, How old are you? And I said, 29, how old have you been acting? It was the first time I put all that into perspective and looked at what how old am I really acting? And I said 15, I think, but was it even that? I had no money. I couldn't handle a job. I couldn't keep a job. They couldn't trust me to take their car of where I might go. There's 15-year-olds that are more responsible than that. <clears throat> And I suppose when I look at that and I understand what we do and what happens, I'm looking at Darren Anderson, the original hand, Darren. He's an alumni. He came here 12 years ago, he told me. Yeah. <clears throat> Much different man from when you walked in, right? You came in when you were 50. Were you a boy or a man at that time when you looked at him? Oh, definitely a boy. Definitely a <laughs> I'm glad I asked you. You jumped right in there with me. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's why I'm so passionate because I get two opportunities. One, I get to be involved with the next generation, literally. And I get to be involved with the next generation and hoping that this thing takes place where boys turn into men. And it's nothing that we necessarily do. God is working in Anthony reality to grow him up in the way that he has brought him here to do so. And it could be in various ways. It all, it's all different. But the question that I ask the boys, the question that I ask all of us in here, are you ready? Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to grow up? Are you capable of facing that which just hovers around the corner, ready for you to step into? Are you capable to do that? Or do you recognize that you have to grow up? Are you a man or a baby boy? Each culture has its way of helping people grow up, David. They, they you know, we do different things. And there's a, a culture that... Um, it's somewhat intriguing to me. It's the Aborigines. They're in Australia. Anybody heard of Aborigines? Yeah. Uh, and some of you may be aware of this, but uh, they have a tribe or a, 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 a group of people that live together, have elders, and they decide uh, with their boys as they observe them, as they train them, how to prepare them to grow up. And they send them on what they call a walkabout. And as they prepare them, they go through a ceremony, and then they send them off. They put war try or war paint on them and they send them off into the, the jungle or wherever it is in, in, or the, the desert and they go on a trek it's a thousand mile journey it's called a walkabout and they're alone they don't have anybody with them they don't have cell phones playstations bottles of water whatever we may take with us right they go on their own and they learn how to navigate through the, it's a thousand mile journey 
and it can take up to six months as they learn to survive and they deal with poisonous and wild they have to kill they have to fish they have to shelter and they have to make their way through this journey all in the hopes that two things happen one that they uncover deeper places spiritually now I don't know what their spiritual beliefs are but I can understand that and also uncover more of who they are See, I can, I can get with that a little bit because the Lord kind of sent me on a walkabout to help grow me up. Right? And so, the hope is that this young man, as he goes through that, and if he lives through it, will come out the other side understanding that he is a man incapable of not only survival, but thriving and living in the way that he's supposed to. And they will treat him as such as a man. The point is to all this is that we need men. And here we sit. 64 men in the program. 25 men in training. Another 25 men on staff. Readily available. Desiring to grow up. But will we answer that call and literally grow up? See, there is no in-between. We like to play the game of adolescence where, you know, uh, well, I'm in this stage where I, I, I'm finding myself and so I, I have some excuses not to grow up. No, you're either a baby boy or you're a man. Does God have you in the process? Yes, He has you in the process. But we have to choose which, which do we want. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, oh I'm a man. I don't know who He's talking to. And I get that thought, and I'm not really trying to come... I'm, you realize I'm talking about myself in the midst of all this, and I'm still going through this process. I, I get it. But we all find out sooner or later where we really are. Am I literally a man? What is that supposed to look like? Am I handling business the way that God desires me to handle business? The Israelites found out some things about themselves. And I know that you guys have heard this story. I'm going to reiterate it because it, there's some... Some powerful points to prove. But let's go to Numbers 13, if you have your Bibles. If not, I'll kind of communicate as we go. But the Lord sent the Israelites on a walkabout. They found themselves in a place where they weren't really ready. And God was breathing to them, look, this is the promised land. This is the land that I am giving to you. Take it. And they were on the southern part of the promised land in a place called Kadesh. And if you look at Numbers 13, it said this, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan. So they went to explore the land of Canaan. Who all knows the story? How many spies? Twelve spies. Right? They go out, they check out the land, they realize there's all sorts of stuff, the Jebusites, the, Hitt the Hittites, all sorts of ites. Right? And they, and they recognize that this is going to be very difficult. They come back and they give a report. And they said, oh man, the land is flowing with milk and honey. It is beautiful. The Lord is showing you guys things. This is your promised land. This is what I have for you. Look, it flows with milk and honey. There is a wife to be had. He showed you through testimonies today what could potentially be in the physical, but not just that, in the spiritual. He's trying to get all of us to realize, Manny and Isabella, he has a future. There's a promised land for you. Right? And they come back from this report, and ten of them, they all say this basically. They reported to the whole assembly, and they showed them the fruit. There's this huge, huge amounts of fruit they carried on a pole. Verse 27, we went into the land which you sent to, which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. Look around this room. The land does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. Can you see? what God is promising. Later on, um, it says in verse 30, now, listen to what Caleb, because everybody started grumbling and complaining, and Caleb silenced the people and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. That's a manly response. Here's the next verse. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack this people, they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report. Later on, chapter 14, verse 1, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept. They cried, they whined, they complained. 
all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole and the whole assembly said to them, "If only we had died in Egypt." Now check this out. They've been brought out of Egypt. They've been brought out of bondage. They're taken through the wilderness. And they're sitting on the edge of the promised land. The Lord is showing them, "I'm giving you this land. Go take it." Ten of them. Only Joshua and Caleb saw that it could be taken. Ten of them looked at it, and they found out all the reasons why. Why they couldn't do it. What it was going to cost. They wanted to be pampered. They wanted to be coddled. They wanted to be taken care of. Some of them even said, let's go back to Egypt. Anybody done that? Isn't that crazy? God is saying, there's the land for you to take. Go take it. I am with you. They're saying, oh, no, 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 look at what we have to battle. Look at the fight that we have to take. Every interview, we ask you guys, are you ready to go to war? And in, in essence, what is the war? What is the battle? It is within you. If you look at what they said, they said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. We look like drug addicts in our own eyes. We can't take the land. We need to go back to Egypt. It's too much. There's too much of a cost. My goodness, we may die. We might die. So what they do? They went through this battle, right? Moses and Caleb, they were among them. They tore their clothes. They sat before the, the, assemb the assembly and they said, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. Let us not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people. Um, if the, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 8, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua and Caleb tried, man. They were pouring out to the people. They were pouring out to the other ten. Listen, man, we can take the land. Let's go for it, John. Go for it. Fight. Don't be afraid. Don't be a baby boy. So what happened? We all know the story. They wandered around for another 40 years doing who knows what. You can read about it in numbers. Right? Without purpose. And God told them, all those that made that decision will not enter into the promised land. So they had to wait for that generation to die off. Eventually, they wound up on the other side. If that's the promised land, all the way up the north side, the northeast corner, on the east side of the Jordan. Now they're looking down at the promised land from the north side. Moses has died. And Joshua is their leader. Now we're in Joshua 1. Boom, go all the way over there. <coughs> Verse 2. Verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give every place you set your foot as I have, as I have promised Moses. And you got a different generation of people. And they went through some things for those 40 years. God prepared them. One generation were a bunch of baby boys. They wouldn't step into it. Now, we got a whole different thing going on. Joshua's leading the fray. They're in the top side looking down and he's saying, listen, now it's time. We're going to take it. We're going to take it. Anybody go around the mountain before and the second time it seemed to work a little bit better? Like what happens in that? Something happens within us. I'm JB. Me and you are on the same page. He gets our heart into a place where we can recognize that there is a promised land and it doesn't matter if I'm on the north side or the south side. Will I take it? And then he, began to, and then he begins to speak some powerful words to him. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Verse 7, be strong and courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He's breathing. He's saying, Josh Blair, man, be strong and courageous. Go after the promised land that I've been showing you. I have something for you, but you have to let go of the fear, that thing, that timidity within you. I didn't give you that spirit of fear, but the power of love and sound mind. Quit standing in the way of what I've called you to. Grab a hold of the promised land that I'm trying to breathe into your life. And now listen to what the men say. They respond. Chapter 1, verse 16. Then they, said, then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And whatever you send us, wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. 
Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you, whatever you may command them, we will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. These, this group of people responded like men, Montana. Right? We'll be with you wherever you go. You tell us what to do and we'll do it. We'll be obedient. We'll go where you tell us to go. We see the promise land. There's an interesting thing, the last scripture that I share with you, it's 1 Corinthians. So here's our choice. All of us as individuals, it doesn't matter if you're in the program, it doesn't matter if you're in high school, in high school, getting ready to graduate, or if you're a woman in here as well. I'm talking about, man, be bold, be strong, be courageous. Whether I'm on the south side or the north side, do I see that God wants me to apprehend this over there? There's a, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians that coincides with some of the wording in Joshua 1. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 and 14. It says this, and I'm going to read it in the King James because then I can extract what I'm talking about a little more clear. It says this, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men. Be strong. Let all the things you do be done with charity. When I break down that King James, that quit you like man, quit you like man, doesn't even make sense to us, right? That word is andridzema. It's used one time in the Bible. One time. And when you translate it, it means act like men. Live like men. And here's the powerful thing. We all know the Old Testament is Hebrew. Right? When they translated Hebrew to the Greek, and then we pull out the English, out of that, the word in Joshua that says, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, and good to mind. Act like a man. Act like a man. Live like men. Quit settling for less. Quit making excuses. Quit looking at why it can't be done. Quit seeing all the ites and grab a hold of it. And trust that God has brought you to a new place. We all have this choice to show oneself, to be a man, to be brave. Paul is saying in this moment, there's some commentary that I wrote, Paul means a man is not a coward or timid or alarmed at enemies, but he is bold and he is brave. Act like a man, Josh. That's why he brought you here. That's why he brought me here. He wants to do something new and powerful. The cool thing to me is this. On the first day of battle, before crossing the Jordan, everybody that knows the story knows that they conquered Jericho first. As they got together, Joshua said this to the men. Consecrate yourselves. That means set yourself apart. Set yourselves apart. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Many Rojas. Consecrate yourself. The Lord will do amazing things among you, for you and Isabella, for your beautiful daughter. Act like a man, Marcus Howard. You've been around, running around the promised land long enough. Amen. All of us that have gone around the mountain more than once are fully aware of what this message is saying. We may not have responded right the first time, but for some reason you're in these seats, Matt State. Act like a man. See the promised land that God is trying to breathe into you. Sean Phillips, you're, you're moving into the promised land. You're believing what he's telling you to do. You're acting like a man. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Jesse Hughes, it's time, brother. Amen? Which one am I? Am I a baby boy or am I, am I a man? Do I make decisions on my emotions? Do I always want what I don't have? Is it always about me? Am I the center of everything? Or do I look to serve, to lay down my life? And if I want to be a man, some things are going to happen. You're going to see my life live under the Lord. You're going to see me looking after my wife. You're going to see me looking after my children. And you're going to see me serving the people around you. You do that, that's a good indicator you're a man. Father, we love you.
I thank you for caring enough about us for not leaving us where we are. I know for me, when I realize I love you, by your grace, my life began to change. It's awful funny, that scripture in Corinthians is in the middle of a chapter on love. Leading our childish ways. Moving towards you. Loving outside of ourselves. That's a man. Help us to be strong and courageous.